All right. <clears throat> Thanks for having me. It's, it's been a very in, uh, enjoyable workshop. I've learned a lot. Um, my name is Ryan Adams, and I'm going to tell you about some joint work with uh, a student, Scott Linderman. And it's going to be, I'm going to be telling you today about what I call discovering implicit networks from, from point process data. So this is going to be kind of a modeling talk, th uh, sort of thinking about, about uh, models for sort of natural graphs and things. So the big motivation is essentially the idea that there's, you know, there's been a lot of interest in the last couple of years in thinking about uh, different kinds of natural networks and different th ways to explain interactions between people and, and objects and so on. Uh, a typical kind of example is to think about social networks where maybe you know, there's, there's people who are friends on Facebook and we want, to, we want to understand maybe latent properties of the people, that is of the vertices, by reasoning about the, you know, by, by the way that they tend to connect to each other. Um, and, uh, and this maybe tells us about dynamics and interesting things about, about these people and the way that, that people interact, say. Uh, but of course, the things that we want to learn from these networks can, be, can often be much more general, thinking about biology, about the interaction between proteins and, and different things, telling us about, about biological pathways and so on. And, uh, and then also there's kind of engineering, computer science type applications where people can frame different kinds of problems such as collaborative filtering, recommendation systems, and so on in terms of these kinds of networks. The common kind of theme here, and, and these are what I, th what I think of as being explicit networks. These are where the data, in a sense, themselves are the edges. So we know about the vertices, and we see ed maybe all of the edges, or maybe some subset of edges, and we want to make, make inferences and do learning about the properties of, say, the vertices, and maybe of the edges, just based on the patterns, okay? Um, but there's a lot of data out there in which we, we think there's some kind of interesting underlying network, but rather than being able to see the edges directly, all we can really see are interesting emissions from the vertices themselves. Okay, so we think there's a network there, but all we see are, for example, point process emissions from each of the each of the vertices, or they, you know, they could be real valued emissions or different kinds of things that uh, that the, the vertices are producing. We think there's dynamics, and we think that the dynamics can be framed in terms of hopefully some interesting sparse underlying graph. And the, and the question is, can we apply some of these same kind of analysis techniques to making inferences and discovering things about the vertices, um, but without ever actually seeing the graph? Okay, and this is what I think of as, as an implicit network. Okay, so let me give you a couple of examples of why we might be interested in this kind of thing. So this is a, this is a big raster plot of recordings from a macaque uh, motor cortex. And, uh, you know, and, and obviously we're very interested in understanding computation in the brain. This is the grand challenge of neuroscience. Um, computation as we kind of understand it in the brain is happening via you know, connections between neurons as, as sort of presynaptic neurons, uh, synapse onto postsynaptic neurons and, and so on. There's obviously this large enterprise that you may have heard of for, called the connectome, where we use different kinds of imaging techniques to recover the wiring diagram of the brain. But we also have things like multi-electrode recordings, such as this, where we maybe actually have the sort of sequence of spikes being emitted by, say, in this case, about 100 neurons. And the question is, can we examine the dynamics on, the, on this sort of raster plot itself, on the, the sequences of spikes, and inf make inferences about what the underlying connectivity is? And this will help us reason about the uh, about the sort of hopefully the computation that's going on here once we understand this network, okay? Um, similarly, we can think about sort of social structures and different things where again, we don't necess necessarily see the networks, but we can, but we, we see kind of the results of interaction. So this is a, uh, this is a small subset of, the, total of the, the murders and armed batteries going on in Chicago between 2001 and 2012. We might reasonably think a lot of this, a lot of these, these, uh, these crimes are related in interesting and complicated ways that have to do with, with sort of gang dynamics and so on. Um, and the question is, can we just from observing sort of this, this, this temporal spatial, uh, spatial temporal point process, can we actually uh, make inferences about, uh, about, for example, these, these, you know, gang warfare and specific sort of geographic coherence uh, of, you know, maybe to drive policy or to drive the deployment of police resources and, and other kinds of things. So this is the kind of general enterprise, but obviously we can, we can sort of invent other examples as well, um, where again, we, we think there's a network there, we just can't see it. The question is, can we discover it and reason about it? So I'm gonna tell you about a kind of a Bayesian approach to this, where we're gonna construct a model um, that's gonna connect these kinds of data to latent graph structures. And the kind of thing I'm gonna tell you about is something called a mutually exciting point process, and in particular, the, the example of this called a Hawks process. Um, I'll tell you about a little bit of sort of a, a nice sort of modeling framework for thinking about the underlying graphs. So rather than the kinds of L1 things that, that we've been hearing a lot about, this is going to be more like a kind of spike and slab type idea where we're gonna have very struct, we're gonna have strongly structured sparsity based on exchangeable random graphs. Um, and then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a data augmentation scheme that makes inference via Markov chain Monte Carlo quite, quite straightforward. 
I'll return to a couple of, uh, of application examples. I should say that this is, this is kind of very new work and unpublished, so the application examples are a little bit raw. Uh, but then I'll also tell you about how we can kind of then further extend this to deal with the specific case of neural data where in addition to the sort of exciting type processes, we also, have in it, uh, we also need to be able to model inhibition. So let me just kind of uh, give you like a really big, I mean a really quick kind of, kind of uh, overview of the, the sort of the point process formalism here. I mean, I'm, I know uh, almost everybody's kind of seen this before or knows it quite well, but uh, essentially point process is this really nice statistical object for, for reasoning about uh, subsets of a, of, of a space. Um, point process is really popular, particularly in, in time and space for thinking about epidemiology, seismology, and, and other kinds of things. Um, the Poisson process, the one that we've all encountered before, uh, makes very strong independence assumptions. It's very elegant, but doesn't allow us to necessarily model interaction uh, in, in interesting and complicated ways, such as might arise from a graph. There's a couple of different ways that we might, uh, we might pursue interaction. Strauss and Gibbs processes, which are very general, but, but rather intractable. Determinantal and permanental point processes. Uh, determinantal point processes tend to just be repulsive point processes, so they tend to anti-correlate. But today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Hawks processes, which are, are mutually exciting, sort of positively correlating processes. Um, so, you know, so we're talking about some, so our point process is going to have some space, and we're, we're getting random subsets. We can think of these as being a random locally finite counting measure. Um, and, and generally, we think of these as being time, and, you know, time or space, you know, the arrivals of buses or uh, how stars and galaxies are distributed, uh, distributed in the universe. I'm going to be sort of focusing on this kind of thing in the bottom right here, which rather than being a sort of a multi-dimensional point process, is a collection of univariate processes, uh, which I'll, I'll sort of think of, sort of call uh, sort of multivariate processes. Um, the Poisson process, uh, it, we're going to be building these things from Poisson processes. So just to, to remind you, Poisson process is kind of defined by two properties. One is the idea that the, the number of points that we get in some, uh, in some region is, uh, is, is they're independent given that the get between two regions are independent given that the regions are disjoint. Um, and the number of events that we expect to get in some area is a function essentially of the, of the intensity measure on that space, which for our purposes we can just think of as, you know, we integrate the function and we get a certain amount of volume. That determines the mean parameter for a Poisson distribution on the number of spikes that live inside of it. So the question is, so if we have, you know, so Poisson is unsatisfying because if we want to model this dependence, then you know, the Poisson explicitly throws that away. We'd like to go, go beyond that. What a Hox process does is it's this really interesting idea in which, for example, if we imagine that we have a collection of, of four sort of point processes in time, when we see a spike in one of them, it's going to induce an increase, uh, sort of a, a temporal, uh, a short-term increase in the, in the Poisson intensity of other of the, uh, of the point processes. And then those further might themselves generate generate sort of new events in this point process, and those might cascade further onto, onto each other, and so we can wind up with this sort of mutually exciting cascade of events. Okay, and you can see why you, why you might think that this kind, of, this kind of mutual excitation might be appropriate for thinking about something like reciprocal violence or about the propagation of synaptic activity in, in the brain. More general, so, uh, so you can imagine that there's a weighted graph kind of sitting beneath there, for example, and, and, and so beyond just uh, increasing the intensity, they could increase the intensity in different ways that is specific to that pair. So you could think about a directed graph and, and the directed edges having weights. Okay? So these kind of models have been around for a while. As I said, they're called Hawks processes. They were originally invented sort of in a univariate setting for thinking about, for thinking about earthquakes and how given that you have an earthquake that you get a temporary increase in the probability of getting additional earthquakes due to aftershocks and so on, but they've been generalized beyond the self-excitation case to, to sort of mutual excitation. And, uh, and you know, the, there's relatively well-defined spectral conditions that ensure that this thing is stable. You can basically think about it in terms of are there any eigenvalues of this interaction matrix that are greater than one, because that's going to roughly correspond to the idea that sometimes you get a spike and its expected number of follow-on spikes is greater than one and that would cause this thing to explode. So we'd like to avoid that kind of, that kind of activity, uh, but, but sort of modulo those, uh, those conditions, it's, it's relatively well understood. So from a modeling point of view, what we're going to want to do is, is take this and treat it kind of as a likelihood and then reason about the graph that's sitting under, underneath it. Okay, so we have these, uh, so we imagine that our data are, set, are a set of spikes, we've seen some interactions, and we, we believe that the, the edges are weighted, and perhaps even more so that, that this is a sparse structure, and we'd like to discover, discover what that graph is. 
So we're going to think of this as a likelihood that's going to be connecting this, uh, this unobserved latent graph to the, uh, the sequence of spikes that we see from each of these guys. Sequence, I keep using the word spikes to mean events because I, I always think of these as neurons. But when I say spikes, replace it in with the word events. Um, and, uh, and so then we're going to be able to turn the crank in a kind of in a, in a, in a Bayesian way and then talk about the distribution that we get over these graphs. And then we can, we can sort of query different marginals of that that we might be interested in. And at the same time, uh, be able to integrate out the nuisance parameters along the way, um, as well as, as sort of think about sort of auxiliary interesting features of this model, such as uh, things like what are, the, what are the temporal kernels that explain the interactions. And as well, we're going to be able to potentially compare different models, different explanations of the structure of these graphs. The kind of the, a very nice formalism for thinking about the graph prior to themselves is to, is to import these really great recent ideas on exchangeable random graphs uh, in which we can, so it turns out that a lot of the ways that we think about models for, uh, for graphs can be framed in a kind of a single framework that is uh, it's called the all, sort of an Aldous Hoover representation, which is essentially the, the graph variant, the sort of the, the array variant, if you will, uh, generalization of DeFinetti's theorem for uh, exchangeable random sequences. Here we're thinking about exchangeable random matrices of various kinds. Um, and what's really nice about this is you can sort of go through the statistics and, and machine learning literature and kind of pluck out interesting uh, approaches that people have invented for modeling different kinds of graphs and that they turn out to have a really nice sort of mapping in terms of this, this Aldous Hoover representation. So the three kind of, you know, three examples are, are the, the classic kind of Erdos Rinyi, of course, uh, in which we're just going to treat everything as independent, as just sort of a GNP type graph, uh, but also things like stochastic block models, where we imagine that there's some latent identity associated with each vertex, and whether or not there's an edge between the two vertices is, is sort of modulated by the, the latent identity. This all this Hoover sort of system works even in the case where you have an, an, uh, an infinite number of possible latent block identities. So sort of think of it like a Chinese restaurant process type type idea latent factor models and also things like latent distance models where the probability of there being an edge between two points is a function of sort of how far they are in some latent sort of vector space embedding. So, the, uh, so this is a very powerful formalism. I, I'm not going to sort of go into details except to sort of to, to point out this really, this really interesting work that, that takes these kind of DeFinetti ideas and, and, and generalizes them to, uh, to this, this array type setting. So for setting up a little bit of notation for this, this Hawks process, um, the idea is we're going to have a set of K vertices that are sort of the things emitting our, uh, uh, emitting our, um, our events. We're going to have then N events on, this, on some interval of time. Um, and this is a marked, you can think of this as, as one big marked point process in which each one of these guys has an index associated with it that represents kind of what neuron or, or it sort of came from. There's some base rate that sits behind it, that sits behind it since that is some, uh, some of the events need to arise kind of naturally without being the product of a cascade. Uh, that is, in the neural setting, maybe these are things like, maybe these, this, is, this is representing the stimulus, or maybe in the crime setting, you know, sometimes people just murder each other and that it's not a retaliation. Um, we can re then when we focus on the graph itself, then we have a binary adjacency matrix as well as a, uh, as, as a weight matrix. These turn out to have a, a, a quite nice units if we normalize this, uh, if we normalize the temporal kernel. So that is, how does the rate increase once we've seen an event on its sort of, on its friends? And, uh, and so if we normalize this to one, then we can interpret, we can interpret the weight of the, of the edges as being the expected number of, of events that one of, these, uh, one of these sequences can induce on another as a result of, as a, result of a spike. And this can be a parametric family of what you can think of as probability densities, so that then we can also think about how to, how to perform inference of the, shape of, that, of the shape of that temporal kernel. We require them to be causal, not surprisingly. You can only cause spikes uh, ahead of you in time, so, it has, uh, so it's, it's zero for, for sort of negative times. Uh, so this is kind of the, this, the, the basic setup. What's really appealing about this, uh, about setting things up this way, is that we can look at the effective instantaneous Poisson rate as a sum of the space rate plus the, uh, the convolutions with previous spikes on this graph, and that this has, this turns out to be a big sum. And if you remember from your sort of, from your theory of Poisson processes, there's this very nice superposition principle that allows you to, uh, to talk about how you would merge uh, a bunch of Poisson processes, and, and you can sort of do that just by summing up their intensities, essentially. And so what that means is that if we think about the, uh, 
uh, if we think about any given spike in one of these Hox processes, it is either explained by the, uh, by the base rate or by exactly one previous spike, okay? Um, that is because we're kind of, we can imagine that we're summing across all of these previous spikes and the base rate. And so then what we can do is come up with a data augmentation scheme that actually just introduces that as a latent variable. You can, and that's this, this Z matrix here, which we can think of as essentially the hypothesis of whether or not sort of one of these events was explained by a particular previous event or by the base rate. Uh, and then once we, we sort of introduce this, then much like as happens in mixture models and, and a lot of other things, then we can sort of turn the, turn the crank on inference uh, quite, a bit, quite a bit more easily. Um, so we can write out th this data augmented likelihood, which looks like this giant miserable thing, but actually isn't that bad. Um, and it, it really what happens when we introduce this, this additional set of latent variables is that we wind up with a Poisson process likelihood that corresponds to the, the things explained by the base rate, and then another Poisson process likelihood for each of the things, uh, each of the, the sort of the things explained by previous spikes. And then these annoying looking integrals here are really just the normalization constants that, that appear in these Poisson process likelihoods. So it kind of looks annoying, but it's actually, it's actually kind of just a product of Poisson processes now, once we've introduced this latent, this, this latent structure. So, so that's something we kind of know how to, know how to handle. Um, there's a couple of other modeling details necessarily. Uh, the parametric family that we've been using, for example, for the temporal kernel is a logistic normal, kind of a scaled logistic normal. This is, this is nice because it gives you compact support. Compact support is nice computationally because now we wind up with sort of sparse Z matrices in that previous slide. Um, for thinking about the log, for the background rate, one natural choice is to use something like a, like a log Gaussian Cox process that's very smoothly varying, but you don't have to pick a, uh, you don't have to pick a particular sort of finite basis and you can include periodicity and other things. Um, the, it turns out that the gamma distribution is, uh, is conditionally conjugate to the, the weights for the edges that exist, so that's, a, that's kind of an easy choice to make. Um, and you can couple those weights together using information from the underlying graph. If you have, for example, a stochastic block model, you could imagine that you get you know, a hierarchical model where the blocks have different priors on, on the weights to get some interesting sort of uh, additional statistical, statistical strength. Uh, I'm not going to go into details about the, the Markov chain Monte Carlo, but it's the, the individual pieces are relatively, are relatively straightforward and tractable. Uh, the graph structure itself can be updated with a really nice sort of col uh, collapse block Gibbs update. Uh, the edge weights, as I said, if you, if you use these gamma distributions, you wind up with a conditionally conjugate posterior distribution. Uh, the, latent, the latent parent explanations, that is the, the data augmentation step, can be done with a big parallel Gibbs, uh, Gibbs update that and several of these go very nicely onto, onto GPUs, it turns out, so you can handle sort of millions of events uh, in, in a relatively efficient way. Handling the, the latent Gaussian process for the background rates can be done pretty well with elliptical slice sampling. And then the temporal kernel, you can use Gibbs sampling if it has a really nice, you know, if it has a nice uh, parametric form or slice sampling if it's a little bit more complicated. Um, in, in practice, this seems to, to mix perfectly well by most of the metrics we use to, to measure these kinds of things. So I thought I'd kind of show you some of the results of, of sort of throwing this, this setup at, at different kinds of data and we can, and you know, I also have sort of, you know, we've done analysis of, of trying to, to do different kinds of validation and, and, and uh, checking to make sure that this is an interesting model, but I kind of wanted to show you the graphs because these are the, these are the fun part. Um, so one thing we could, so one, one kind of data, uh, data set that we looked at here is to think about different kinds of, uh, different kinds of financial in instruments on the stock market. So these are, uh, these are, upticks and downticks from 10 different stocks in the S&P 100. Uh, so this is sort of intraday, these are intraday ticks over one week in September 2009. Uh, there are five, uh, five financial uh, sort of financial se sector stocks and five uh, tech sector stocks, and we're modeling the upticks and downticks separately. The model doesn't know about any of these sectors or any of the upticks versus downticks, but it discovers that the, it discovers the, not surprisingly, the block structure, which is basically that there's, there's more direct causal effects kind of within the sector than there are across sectors, and that down ticks and up ticks are, are, are sort of, uh, have more block structure than, um, uh, than sort of they, they do across. But at the same time, the, um, an uptick in, within an instrument tends to, uh, tends to be more likely to induce a down tick in the same instrument, which isn't that surprising since things are kind of mean reverting. Um, the, uh, and then on the right here is, is uh, essentially a posterior means of block membership, um, and it sort of not surprisingly discovers the blocks associated with these different sectors. The, uh, what's really interesting though, you'll notice that there's these crazy bands 
uh, in, this, in this figure here, which look like ambiguous block membership by one of the stocks. And, uh, and if you look closely, and, and the lighting is a little bit tough, but there's, there's equivalent bands in which one of these guys has uh, a, a surprising, inf one of the financial stocks has a surprising amount of influence on the, uh, basically on, on everybody. And, um, and it turns out that that thing is Goldman Sachs. <laughs> and uh, you, can, you can draw conclusions from that if you want. But, the, uh, but it, it is kind of interesting. These bands are, are Goldman Sachs appearing to have membership in, in, the, in the tech sector. And, and I th this, maybe this has to do with sort of large-scale hedging strategies. It's, it's, it's not obvious what it is because I don't think any of us have a, a strong idea of what Goldman Sachs is doing behind the closed doors. But, um, but I, I think it's kind of fun, to, it's kind of fun to, look at, to look at this graph. So we can, um, we can also go back and look at these, at these uh, Chicago murders and, and armed, armed batteries. And here it's a little bit more complicated because we actually don't have the identities of the vertices in addition to not having the edges themselves. So we actually have, but we might expect that the identities of these vertices have interesting spatial coherence, right? That there's like a group um, of, uh, of, of, say, murders that are sort of related. And the reason we might think that is because uh, the gangs actually do exist in Chicago. And so the Chicago Police Department, who makes these data available, um, has, uh, has tried to sort of produce hand curated maps of different, um, of the different gangs, such as the Gangsters, Disciples, and Two Six, and, and, and all these, these different guys. And then there's an additional level of hierarchy as well, uh, which is that there's alliances between the gangs themselves. So there's Folk Nation and People Nation, and there's sort of some amount of spatial coherence between these, these gang alliances. So we think that there's actually this spatial coherence, so what we can do is take this, this model I've sort of told you about and then add an additional layer of modeling in which we try to, uh, uh, in which we try to find the groups, start, sort of try to discover the vertices essentially using a Dirichlet process, so it allows us to reason about, about an unbounded possible number of uh, such groups, and then also the graph that's kind of sitting on top of them. And then you can see that we motivated the background rate for this by observing that there's massive seasonal variations, actually, in, in, the, way that, uh, in the way that people murder each other. And, uh, and that I think this in Chicago has to do with the fact that it's really cold in the winter, and it's, so people aren't outside, so I guess it's harder to shoot them. Um, and so, the, uh, so you'd like to be able to, you'd like not to wind up explaining the background rate with your model, right? You'd like to have that be explicit. So, um, so these are sort of the elliptical regions that, so we use Gaussian distributions to describe the spatial coherence. And then there's a graph that kind of sits on top of this. And like I said, this is preliminary work, so I don't want to draw too many conclusions, but you can see that it kind of has an, a non-trivial resemblance with, the, with sort of these, uh, these, these gangs, the, the, the sort of the coloring of the, of the gangs before. Um, what we'd really like to do is obviously kind of engage the Chicago Police Department with, with this and see if they have any, sort of like if they had domain knowledge about sort of gang wars and things that, that went on uh, during, this, during this span of time. Um, another kind of predict, you know, kind of, kind of evaluation check we can do with this is to actually try to make predictions about murders. So, you know, and, and, and these, these kind of assaults, we can go in and, and say, okay, given that we've observed all these events up to some time, um, let's try to make an estimate of what, the, what sort of cascades of violence might occur and then, um, and then use that to form essentially a predictive intensity and then look and see whether or not things actually happen. And so Memorial Day 2012 was a pretty dangerous time in which there were sort of eight murders and then 20 or so uh, armed batteries. And this is the prediction that the model uh, attempted to make. And you know, it, it hits some of the high density, you know, some of the high density regions look, look pretty reasonable, although obviously there's this stuff up in the north where there's a bunch of batteries that, that we didn't really sort of expect to see. Um, so like I said, this is, this is preliminary, but I think it's, it's, it's quite promising. Um, so, um, so let me just, in the, in the time remaining here, kind of move on to, uh, to the, the extensions that we do for handling, with ne handling neural data specifically. So these have all been about excitation, but neural data also has a, a really significant inhibition uh, component. So sometimes something happens and that actively decreases the rate on, on postsynaptic neurons. And uh, you can extend this model to have that, although the nice data augmentation scheme kind of goes out of the window because now we need to have negative rates and so the super, superimposition uh, principle doesn't apply. And indeed, we have to ensure that the rates are always positive. So that is that the resulting rates are always positive. So we use a, uh, we use a saturating nonlinearity. And when you sort of put those pieces together, it starts to resemble really strongly um, the, the popular generalized linear model from, uh, from the neuroscience literature. And this being kind of a Bayesian variant of that with also this, this kind of Aldous Hoover graph machinery sitting beneath it. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so it's kind of, a, 
interesting to turn the crank and now kind of, again, producing the kind of picture that, that you will see, that you sometimes see in, in neuroscience papers. Um, the, so what we have is some background rate that is going through, that is combining with uh, sort of previous activity to produce, going through a, no, a nonlinearity to give us our Poisson process, uh, sort of our instantaneous Poisson rate, that then this, the network modulates through the temporal impulse again to, to perhaps uh, add or redu reduce the, uh, the, the incoming background rate kind of in the next time instant. Um, we can apply this kind of model to, uh, to some, some data. So for example, retina, recordings from retinal ganglion cells. So these are in the retina of a, of a macaque. And, the, um, and they have kind of, they have, there's two different types. There's some that become more active when they, when they have light shined on, on them and others that become less active when light shines on them. Um, and there's complicated interactions. I mean, from, this, is, this is biological reasoning. That, uh, and the neuroscientists know that, that the sort of the, uh, the ones that come on tend to synapse to each, onto each other in an excitatory way and onto the other type in an, inhibit, in, in, uh, inhibitory way. And the model can sort of discover this from the spiking pattern alone um, that, and, and find a, a spatial layout kind of up to rotation and translation. Uh, as well as the, the stimulus filter. So it knows, about, it knows about the stimulus as well because that's being, that's being captured now by the, the, the background rate. And we can also look at a latent distance plus stochastic block model type, type graph prior and see that there, uh, it recovers the two different types of neurons uh, and as well recovers the idea that they tend to, to synapse in this, in this kind of competing way across the types and then on top of that also tend to synapse onto ones that are nearby. Uh, and, and so the, the sort of probability of getting edge, an edge between two neurons drops off monotonically as a function of the distance between them. Okay, so just to sort of, sort of wrap up, I mean, what, this, what this is about is, is trying to do, uh, to sort of discover networks when we can't see the edges and trying to come up with probabilistic models that allow us to reason about these things where we're just seeing noisy emissions from the, uh, from the vertices or perhaps even having to understand how to collect our data together to discover what those vertices might be. Um, the, uh, the purely excitatory model here in a, in a kind of a Bayesian setting has, has a pretty nice data augmentation scheme for inference. Uh, the, uh, and, and it goes pretty fast, and you can put it on a GPU. The, uh, the inhibitory case that's important for neural data is a little bit, a little bit more complex, but, but still seems to recover sort of interesting things about the biology, even when you sort of hide your eyes and, and, and don't let it know about it a priori. Uh, so, like I said, this is, this is joint work with a student at Harvard, uh, Scott Linderman, and thank you all for, for listening. Yeah, okay, so the, the, the question is, if I may paraphrase, that you know, these spikes, these abstract spikes are actually are the result of a complicated pre-processing step that neuroscientists do after they implant a, uh, a, uh, an, an, an electrode array into a monkey brain, and that they actually get continuous voltages, and then they run spike sorting algorithms to turn that into a point process. And, and that's absolutely true. Um, and so I'm sort of tr treating the action potentials as ground truth when the reality is that there are, there are membrane potentials that are sitting there. Um, so, I mean, I think there's room for sort of, I mean, the point process observation approach is just one. You could, uh, you could imagine doing the same, the same kind of framework with, for example, reasoning about the interactions between stochastic differential equations over, over continuous things, and, and I think kind of do a very similar implicit network discovery. Here I'm just imagining that, it, that we really do have atomic events and, and kind of sweeping that under the rug. But, but that's a, um, I mean, you can see that the, the effect that this happens by, I, by uh, the fact that on that very, very early raster plot of the, the neurons, that there was like 107 neurons or something, which seems like a strange thing because the electrode array has actually only 100, only 100 uh, sort of prongs on it. And, and that's because the spike sorting thing actually tries to resolve, uh, resolve the spikes based on the, on the underlying continuous signals. Uh, but yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a very good point. But I, I think it generalizes. Okay, so uh, the, the question was, um, 
I, I'm making a homogenous assumption about using kind of the same impulse response across everybody in, in the network, and is that a computational reason, or is there interesting, or you know, are there, are there actual like modeling reasons for that? It's 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 a simple you know it's a simple sort of simplifying assumption that we made in this case, but it would be straightforward to to for example couple that to the latent block identities or allow it to be spatially homogeneous or, or kind of you, if if you had a reason to do it which we just happen not to you could build in interesting you know interesting things like I would think for example like there's a reason to believe that like I don't know the neurotransmitters associated with inhibition and excitation might be might be very might have very different sort of like have lives in the in the, in the brain for example and so there you might want to use that latent identity to modulate the temporal kernel but we we haven't we haven't explored that. I mean, we do infer the temporal kernel, but just one for the whole set. 